be back with all of you. It's good to see all of you again and uh, look forward to beginning a uh, good, nice relationship where Agnes and I will come worship with everybody uh, uh, pretty regularly. Uh, we had a good uh, uh, holiday break. I hope all of you did too and look forward to chatting with all of you, getting to see how all of you have fared over the holidays and just see how we're all doing. And then also to proceed on into this year uh, worshiping the Lord together. Um, if you want to go and open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, that's where we're going to be spending our time this morning uh, in the Bible class. Um, before we go ahead and start getting into the, into the Bible class, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer, if you would, bow with me. Our dear, awesome God and Father, we are so very grateful that you have given us this opportunity this morning to assemble together at this time to study your word. Help us to humble ourselves to your word and to, to meditate on it that we might consider um, some thoughts that you would have us, that you would have us learn uh, from, the letters that, from the letters of Paul this morning. Help us to, to look and to study deeply uh, what, what Paul was trying to communicate to the church that was in Rome, that we might gather and, and apply uh, lessons and applications for ourselves, so that we can maybe be more faithful and, and, and pleasing Christians to you. Help us to edify each other and to, to help each other grow as we're all striving to, to get to heaven, to be with you for eternity. Help us all to do our very best to help each other in our growth, to watch over each other, but also in humility to, to look at each other in love that we might, we might love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and not just as, as people. Help us to keep our minds focused on things above in that eternity with you. Remember that keep you always in the, in the center of our lives and all that we do. All we pray through your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so this morning, I'd like for us to kind of look over Romans chapter one and uh, kind of going to give some background going over the first half of the book. And then we're going to go spend most of our time uh, from verses 16 to the end of the chapter. We're going to kind of try to work away uh, verse by verse and see what applications we can draw from, from this text this morning. So a little uh, bit of context setting up. When we read the book of Romans, there's a few things we need to understand about Paul and why he's writing this letter and a few things that he's thinking going into it. First of all, uh, this is a letter written by Paul. We, we see that in verse 1. He identifies that he himself is the author. Um, at least the, uh, this, this letter is uh, attributed. It's his message to the, to the Romans. Uh, he spends time uh, kind of setting himself up. Uh, in verses 1 through 7. He's kind of giving more background as to why he's doing this and who he is and, and why this is important. And that kind of begs the question for those of us as readers trying, trying to read this and gather and, and piece together why he's writing this the way he is. This is Paul writing to a church that he did not start. He knows about it. He's heard about them. But he himself did not start this church. And so that, with that in mind, that can help us better understand kind of why he talks about things the way he does and, and uh, also understand the content of the, of, the, of, the, of the letter. He's writing to a group of Christians that, of this group that he did not start, so he's kind of trying to cover all his bases. He's trying to uh, encourage them, but also there's a, lot, there's a lot more in this information. This is probably one of Paul's most uh, extensive and, and a harder to understand uh, letters because of that. He doesn't know the church, so he's having to, to talk about subjects more in depth um, to kind of cover all his bases to get his message across to them. But that is, is something we need to keep in mind as we read the book of Romans, and that will play some part into what we're going to be talking about this morning in verses 16 to the end. And then he spends uh, the section, verses 8 through 15, kind of talking about how he's been wanting to come to them, but he hasn't been able to. He's been delayed. He's been working with other groups, and, and things have just called for where he needs to stay with them, or he's been prevented by, by winter or, or by travel in some sort, and he's just, he hasn't been able to make his way over to Rome. So he's writing to them this letter and trying to, to encourage them with, but he doesn't know what they know, and so he's trying to cover a lot of bases in this letter. And then that brings us to verse 16, which is where we're going to be start going through the end of the chapter this morning. Um, does it, before we kind of go into that, does anybody have any questions? I will do my very best to, to answer questions as I have. Um, please bear with me. I'm, I'm new to this as much as everybody else is, and I'm, I'm growing, and I need time to adjust, to get to know everybody, but also to kind of learn as I try to learn to be what I want to be, and that is... Uh, one who studies and tries to help us all grow in this way. But does anybody have any questions so far that, that I can try to, my best to answer before we get into our text this morning? Okay, no. Let's begin uh, reading in verse 16. Can I get someone to volunteer to read verses 16 and 17? Uh, we're in Romans 1, by the way, for, for those who walked in late. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Can I, Russell? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Okay, thank you. So in verse 16 and 17, we have here uh, 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 two verses that many of us who have grown up in the church, been Christians for a long time, probably have heard at some point. Uh, we, you know, this is one of those verses that, grow, if you grew up in the church, this was probably a memory verse that you had. You know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power, of, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first. But this is significant. Uh, and this is significant for the day and age they lived in and in the way that people thought. And so, if you remember, uh, this would have been months ago, so I understand if maybe we don't remember, but we talked about before how in the ancient world, they lived in an honor and shame culture, and they think differently than we do today. And there are certainly aspects of that in our culture, but in our culture today, uh, because of the way the world is going and the, and the further away our, our country and our culture moves away from God, the more we kind of just brush that under the rug and now you're judging me, and, and th that's wrong because you made me feel bad. That's the kind of culture we live in today. But in their day and age, honor and shame culture shaped the way they lived. You see, if you have essentially this system where everybody wants to look good in front of everybody, and in order to do that, you have to do what these groups of people that you're trying to appeal to, what they think is good. So, for example, if you're a fisherman and you want to be known as a good fisherman and you want to be able to make trade with people, well, you've got to do things that maybe this fisherman group over here that they say is good. Maybe you've got to catch in uh, this amount of fish or you've got to catch in the certain kinds of fish. Or maybe you need to live by this kind of fisherman's code kind of thing. But by doing so, you gain the support and the, the approval of this fisherman's group. And so because you have their approval, they're giving you honor. They make you look good. They say, wow, that, that guy's really good at what he does. And so what that's going to do is that's going to make them say, we, we want him to be part of our group because that's going to make the group look good. We've got this guy on our team. And so that's going to make the group all look good. And so this, you have this kind of um, this circular uh, system in which both people are helping each other. You, the group is giving honor to this individual. And now when this individual joins the group because they want him to be part of the group, this individual is also bringing honor to the group. So how does that apply to what we're looking at here in verse 16? I want us to see this in the text. Paul is saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation. In other words, he is giving a reason why he teaches why he does, what he does. He's giving his reasons as to why he is going to be putting all his time and energy and effort into the gospel. He's not ashamed of it, and he approves of it, and he's going to proclaim it, and he's going to give honor to God in doing so because he believes in the gospel in this way. If you look back in verse... Um, 15, again, we talked about how in this section he's talking about how he's been wanting to come to the people in Rome, but he's been delayed. But in verse 15 he said, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who, in Rome, who are in Rome. He's going to try to cover his bases, and so when we come to verse 16, he's going to say, this is why I believe in the gospel, and this is why you should too. He's starting to kind of give them the framework as to why they should believe in the gospel, and why he does, and why he's going to begin proclaiming that. He is not ashamed of the gospel. He's going to proclaim the gospel because... It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he says that in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for, from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He's setting up the groundwork as to answering questions that people might have. Imagine you are someone who, you might believe in, a, in a, an all-powerful being, but you don't really know who that is, or you have different uh, ideas of who God is. Paul is kind of setting the groundwork as to why you should believe in the God that I'm about to tell you about. Because in, this, in the gospel, the good news of God, you see the righteousness of God revealed from faith for faith. And he's kind of setting that groundwork for them. And then when we look at the rest of the chapter, what we're going to see is he's going to describe how mankind has interacted with God throughout history. And he's going to use this to kind of set up everything else in the rest of the book. Does anybody want to ask a question or make a comment so far? Yes, sir. Does Paul give any indication of what kept him from coming early to Rome? Does he? Oh. Uh, he? We talked about it here in verse 8. Why don't we go ahead and read this section here? And um, this is that. Uh, let's see what he says. Verse 8. First, I thank my God, to Jesus Christ, for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. 
For God is my witness, for whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, always asking this how, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may recap, reap some harvest among you as well as the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to, to you also who are in Rome. So again, in the letter, he's telling him, I've been wanting to come to you, but I've been prevented. In this letter specifically, he doesn't give a reason why he hasn't been able to come. But when we look at other letters of Paul, we see other things that have prevented him as well. Um, I believe in 1 Corinthians, between 1 and 2 Corinthians, um, in 1 Corinthians, he wrote a letter to them kind of addressing the problems they were having in that church. And then in 2 Corinthians, he's kind of addressing some of the, uh, the issues and, and concerns that they had about Paul in 2 Corinthians. And one of those things was that they were saying, you're vacillating, you don't really want to come and see us. And he addresses that in the second letter. And some of his reasoning is that I've been prevented by winter. Other times I've been, you know, I saw where there's a really good opportunity here, I need to go do this. Um, he doesn't give us a reason specifically for the Romans why he hasn't been there. But when we kind of put together everything we know from Paul's letters, uh, which I, I admit uh, I'm not as fresh on right now in my mind. I need to go study that some more to be able to give you a more appropriate and detailed answer. But we, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just an yeah, uh, yeah, there are answers to that. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, I, I, I'm, I apologize. I'm not entirely prepared to give those this morning, um, but I can go study those and have those prepared if, if you would like to have those for next summer. Does anybody else want to ask a question or make an observation so far on just verse 16 and 17? Well, the, the audience that he's writing to here is primarily Gentile, and actually you can kind of see that in verse 16 where he says, to the Jews, brothers, I you said absolutely true they, all of these are within the realm of possibility again we have the, we have the uh, the crumbs of information here the question now comes of uh, piecing it all together and that's something certainly uh, I, I've, I've studied them I've seen them uh, people presented them to me before um, but as far as putting them together myself <laughs> admittedly I haven't I haven't done enough study to where I can present that to you but the crumbs are there and certainly uh, from the letters themselves we do have all this information and all these questions and, and suppositions uh, that brother Russell presented they're absolutely true and and especially to what you were saying about uh, the church at Corinth, you know, they, they didn't have all the information. And so these accusations they made against him, uh, why are you not wanting to come to us? You don't like us, or you're just trying to, you just want our money. I, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, that's one of the accusations they make against him, because that was one of the things he, he talked to them about in 1 Corinthians. You just, you just want us to send you money, and, and he has to address that. And he does so in a very 
in a loving way, but he's also direct with them and, and telling them, I've, this is what I've been doing this whole time. Um, but yeah, all of these things are, are certainly true of Paul's life and, and very, very valid and good questions to ask. Um, anybody else want to ask a question or make an observation on verse 16 or 17? Yes, sir. It's, it's almost as if he classifies the people of Rome in, alone, you know, in a special group. Because he says, I am a debtor to Greeks, barbarians, wise, unwise. And now I'm ready to preach to you people. <laughs> it's a little wild. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, why well, take so much time to kind of uh, to qualify uh, who he's preaching to there in that way? I don't know. We may need to go back and study that some more, but absolutely. It, it, he is writing to an individual group, and he's, he's, he's definitely tailoring his message to them, specifically. Good observation. Anybody else want to make one so far? Okay. Now let's move to, to verse 18. Now this is personally one of my favorite uh, sections of Scripture. Uh, verses 18 to the end. Paul is going to give a description of mankind from the beginning and kind of their relationship kind of their relationship between them and God, and you get to see kind of what happened. Why did the world get to the way it is? Why, why is there a separation? Why is there evil in the world? And in fact, for when you think about, uh, Brother Russell pointed out that he's, this church here is mostly Gentiles, and that is certainly true. And Paul says that, I want to preach to you. I want to, I want to reap some harvest to you. He's going to be preaching to Gentiles about the gospel. And think about if you're a Gentile, You've grown up in a different culture, especially if you're Roman. If you're Roman, your, your, your culture says that there are many gods. It's very similar to uh, the, the Greek gods, you know, Zeus and Hades and all these kind of people. You have all these different gods who are gods of different things. And so you, you grew up in a, in a polytheistic culture, and now you have this man coming and preaching the gospel to you about one god. And, and you might have questions, why should I listen to you? Why? Tell me about your god. Let me consider, is, you know, what do you say about your god and all these things? And Paul is telling them. But also, this would explain for a Gentile if they had questions like, why is there such evil in the world? Why, based on your, on your theology, if there's one God, well, how did, how did all, this, all these things happen? And Paul's going to kind of address these things in this section of text. And let's, let's go ahead and read that and see what happened uh, between God, God and his relationship to man. Can I get someone to volunteer to read uh, verses 18 through 23? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known by God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they know they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking may be futile, and their foolish hearts are dark. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, made to look like a mortal human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. Thank you, sir. So there's a lot here in this little paragraph in this section of text. There's also a lot here kind of explaining what happened between God and man. Does someone want to summarize what Paul is kind of describing here in, in these few verses, between verses 18 through 23? Who, who can kind of give a, a, a short summary of what Paul is explaining in this paragraph? Okay, yeah, let, let's start there with just that idea. So he's, he's ta he starts off by saying, you know, that um, the wrath of God has been revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. Uh, and this unrighteousness uh, is being produced by men who, who are suppressing the truth. In other words, let, let's simplify this to a, 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 uh, even further. God, as God, when he created the world through the natural order of things, 
He has created a divine order and he, God has already set the rules, essentially. God says, this is right, this is wrong. This is right, this is wrong. And it says, the wrath of God of heaven is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So you have God has already established the rules. This is right, this is wrong. And then you have men who by, or are doing these things that God says is right and wrong. They are suppressing the truth. God has given the rules, and then you have men who are doing these evil things, and they're saying, that's, that's not right. That, that's not true. Suppressing the truth, changing the perspective, so that way what they're doing isn't wrong. We already have a, a problem here. We have the creator setting the rules, and then you have mankind as the created saying, you know what? I don't like that rule, so I'm going to change the rule. That's what we have here, and, and Paul is going to continue to elaborate this uh, further. In verse 19, Paul says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Verse 20, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. What, Paul, what is Paul describing there? He's talking about if you want to see God, you can see him in his creation all around. I can, um, it's the evidence for God is in creation. And it also is within man itself. Um, those, those are the things, those are the basic tenets for being able to say that there is a God. Something had to create all of this. Something had to create you and me. And that is God. The fact that there is a greater power, that is, that is clear. You look out in nature, you can't look out in nature and not see God in that. It's, it's, too, it's too clearly detailed to have not been created in a, in a very special and specific way. And that calls out to a greater power. What, if you think about this from a Gentile perspective, again, depending on what culture you're on, you, you already have a different uh, belief system of, of, what, uh, of who God is or who the gods are and what they do. And Paul is giving an explanation that some, about fundamental thing, the, the fact that there is a greater power and that you can see that in nature, that, that's not what's in question here. Even in the, in the ancient world, you know, today we live in a, in a society where many people are saying there is no God, there is, there is no greater power, there is no, there is no God of any way. But in the ancient world, nobody thought that way. Everybody believed in a God of some sort or gods of some sort. And, and it's interesting how from then to now, we've shifted from there. Why is that? From a Gentile perspective, they're, they're looking for God and they're, they're explaining these things by, uh, through uh, the pantheon of gods. You know, there's a sun god who takes care of all these things. There's a, a wind god, a sky god, uh, a sea god, all these different things or, or whatever, depending on, again, whatever culture you're talking about. And so Paul is, is, is bringing back to their attention the fact that it's, it's clear by nature that there is a God, there is a greater power. But what he's also explaining is that the attributes of God, his divine nature, what he says is right and wrong, the fact that he exists, that is also clearly perceived. And he says that it is clearly perceived so that they are without excuse. So that's, there's already an application for us today. The world says, tries to tell us there is no God. The Bible tells us the attributes of God are clearly perceived so that we are without excuse. If someone wants to say that there is no God and, well, I don't, I don't see any evidence for God, and when they die and when the judgment happens, 
they're not going to get to use that as an excuse. Oh, I didn't know God existed. How did I know I was supposed to obey God? I I didn't know there was a God. Nobody ever told me. That's a, a different issue of itself. But they themselves can't make the claim that they didn't know there was a God because they've never seen him before. You see him all out in nature. And also his divine power. I also really like that Paul make, take the time to mention. He says the divine nature is also something that has been clearly perceived. In other words, God has given us that what, what we call a conscience. A right and wrong. An inner right and wrong. That comes from God. And all these things cry out to, to, to a, a greater power. Yes, sir. How, how, do we, how, do we, how do we see or how do we uh, testify to the divine nature of God today by looking at what surrounds us? How, how do we testify to the divinity so let me let me uh, just clarify your question with you. How do we test? Are you are you asking me how do we how do we prove it? Is that what you're asking? Well, I mean, it, it's, it says here that for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm just sitting here wondering. How, how could I show uh, today uh, a little child, for instance, the divine nature of God in what we see around us? Okay, so how could you show somebody else that there is a God in what we see around us? Um, if, if that's what it's saying. I, I, you know, no, that is certainly what the text is saying. As far as um, how would I communicate that to someone or a child, uh, I need to think about that some. Uh, I don't have any children, so I don't know how I would explain that to a child. But I, <laughs> I, does anybody else want to maybe answer his question while I think about it? Brother Jim? You know, this isn't exactly not about dealing with a child, but I find it interesting if you take <clears throat> really any society, whether it was Greeks, Romans, the Celts in Northern Europe, or somebody over in South America way back when, all these they all, you know, they didn't know the God of Abraham, mm-hmm. okay? But they all felt the need to create a God. They knew something was more than that. They, you know, the sun God, the moon God, whatever. They, but they, they all, you know, are required to believe in something like that. They didn't know the God of Abraham, so they went out and they created an explanation, or they created a, their own version of that. You know, so they are hardwired to believe in God or a God. Or, and I, you know, I don't know how that fits in, but I, but I take it as evidence that, you know, we, we were created by God because we're hardwired to believe it. Yeah, so. Does that make sense? Yeah, so just to clarify what you're saying, you're saying the fact that in the ancient world, because everybody attributed something to some God, that there seems to be a, 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 a natural inclination to, to, to look for and to cry out for a greater power. And that is serving as evidence that there is a greater power, the fact that this seems to be a, a, a natural thing that God has given us in his creation. Yes, absolutely. And that's, that's the point I believe Paul's making here uh, with what he's saying. The fact that uh, we all cry out. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry. It, it, relative to what Jim was saying, it says here in uh, 23, in exchange of the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So, yeah, we, we like he says, we knew of a God. And basically what we did was we didn't glorify God himself, we glorified ourselves because whatever we created resembled us or resembled the things that we depended on, like animals, trees, and so forth. What, what we, what we uh, interpreted as giving us life or adding to our lives, uh, idolatry, in other words. But, but this is still the idea uh, I, I'm just reminded of an old movie I saw a long time ago called 
Jesus, and where a, a, a deaf, dumb guy had, had had an orphan child that he picked up from the street, and she saw in a window God, the word God, and she asked him, what is God? And because he couldn't speak, he found it very difficult to tell this time or to show this time what was God. How would you show your time? The divine nature of God, based on what Paul was saying here, that the Romans should have known uh, the God of Abraham. They should have known God simply by the surroundings that they had. They should have known even the invisible power, invisible qualities of God. Brother Jim, did I see your hand first? No, I was just kind of weird. No, uh, I'm still thinking here. So. Okay. <laughs> Brother Kevin? Yeah, Deuteronomy 6, verses uh, 6 and 7 says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And how do you get children to know? You teach them. You teach them. And you teach them. It's a constant, you know, children learn to not believe in God. They're taught there is no God. You know, so they grow up, there is no God. But if you teach them that there is a God from a very young age, they see God everywhere. He created the trees. He created the sky. He created the moon. He created the stars. It's a continual teaching. And God understands that you have to continue to teach because teach them when they lie down. Teach them when they rise up. You've got to keep teaching. Adults, for example... You know, we come to Bible study and we grow and we learn. We stop coming. Guess what happens to us? We start doubting things. We start having spiritual problems and we can't figure it out. Well, because we stop studying. And it's, it's the same thing with children. Absolutely. Very well said. Okay. I want to come and well, let's, let's try to answer that. And how would we uh, address that based on what Paul is saying? But first, let me get to Brother Russell's comment. Try to begin answering your question. I, I'm sorry. I, can you? Would you? Can you tell me your name, brother? I don't know that I've ever met you before. So, what, uh, what's your Bruce. name, brother Bruce? To try to answer your question, uh, you start with teaching in some with some sort of. Uh, brother Kevin and brother Russell have pointed out. You know, you start by teaching children young. That's how you would begin teaching a child. But in the context of Romans, you, you're right. You know, based on what Paul is saying, how would you argue this to someone who who hasn't grown up knowing the God of Abraham? Because he said they have been clearly seen. He said the, the invisible qualities of God, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen. And, and I'm just wondering, what is he referring to that would show me uh, the, that invisible nature, the divine nature of God? Yeah. So based on what Paul is saying, and I want to get to all of your comments uh, in just a second. Based on what Paul is saying, you're right. Um, these things are clearly seen. What I would suggest, though, is Paul is not saying that the, the, the people, uh, the Gentiles, ought to have known the God of Abraham necessarily, specifically. I think his main point is that it is clear when you look at nature there is a greater power. 
and that these people have tried to explain this away by multiple gods, maybe one god, depending on what their culture is. But there's, there, there's this inner question that God has built into us because we see, when we look at a nature, we see that, you know, who, who created that? And what we're trying to answer is, who, who is the one who did it? Is, you know, you have this explanation that multiple gods did this. Well, is that right? Okay, that makes sense. You know, so maybe someone says, okay, I'm, I'm going to believe that. Paul is now offering another possible answer to that question. It is clear. We, we, see, we look at nature. We look at the trees. We look at the sky. Well, well who did that? Paul is trying to say, let me tell you, this is the God who did this. You're, you're seeing his attributes already. I want to, I want to show you who he is. And he, he, we've already been explaining this to, to the Jews. They've grown up already knowing this God. I want to tell you about the same God so that way you can know and you can put his name to his work. I want to teach you who is the real God who did all this. He's offering another explanation that is contrary to what they would have already known that answers these questions. Because God has built in us these questions of, that was designed, who did it? Paul is saying, I want to tell you who did this now. I think I saw your, your or I, did you see? You saw a funny question. Well, it, it was basically what you're saying. I think children see God more clearly than we do because we try to explain away a lot of the things that we think God should be and what God should be. And if you look at, um, going to your comment, um, how we're you know, smarter than all this, Einstein, um, all the things that he uh, discovered and whatever else, he did actually come to the conclusion that there was something else greater out there. Now, whether he believed in God, I don't know. But even him, through all of his um, research and you know discoveries, did come to the conclusion that there was something else greater out there. So I think what happens is that as children, we're very innocent and we don't have all of this other information. You know, they see God more clearly than adults do because that's when we start to try to rationalize and, and discover for ourselves what we can do. And I think that's why the Greeks and you know Romans came up with those guys to explain things that they couldn't explain. Exactly. I think that's exactly what they were doing. And, and again, in the context of what Paul is saying, he's saying, you guys already have it, your explanation of how I did this. Let me propose a different explanation. There, let me show you something about this other guy who we believe done, done it this way. Uh, and, and, and you can consider, is he the real God versus what, what makes more sense, the way you've explained it or the explanation I'm about to give? And he's setting this up again. This is chapter, I mean, the chapter divisions, those are man-made. Those were not a part of the original document, so uh, nowhere did Paul write chapter two. <laughs> it, this is all one continuous letter. But you still see at the beginning of this letter, Paul is setting them up by explaining the fundamental things that they all understood. We all understand someone created these things outside. What is the explanation? You, you created this explanation. Let me offer you a different explanation. And this is setting up everything else he's going to talk about in the rest of the letter. And that's what I believe we should take away from, from these few verses here, from verse 18 through 23. Uh, he said that they are without excuse. To, to make the claim that there is no God as a way to kind of explain away these things. Uh, you made the comment that, uh, uh, well, science explains these things now. Again, that is still another type of explanation to the things that we're looking for answers for. Now, is it a good explanation? I don't believe so. I don't, I don't think anybody in here believes that in place of God. There are certain things science does explain. Science has proven and it's been tested. But not all of them. And when you try to use science to explain away God as in he doesn't exist, th those two things are meant to go together. God has put that in place to prove that he exists. But when you try to use it to prove that he doesn't exist, now you're, you have two things that are meant to go together. And you're having to compete against each other. Brother Jim, I saw your hand first. Yeah. And then we'll the science, science versus God, and you, you just, you're just commenting on, you know, just my own personal experience. Before I was a Christian, years, years prior to me being a Christian, just taking medical courses. Okay? And I remember studying cellular structure and, and, and anatomy, physiology. So, you know, and I was broke. You know, my, my dad taught me about who Jesus and God and the church and so forth when I was younger, but, uh, but I was brought up on Darwin. You know, you know. But you had that white ball moment, moment in studying cellular structure, but this was not an accidental thing. Mm -hmm. This was well thought out, well planned, you know, a creator, an intelligent design, you know, and, you know, as I was years away from being a Christian, but I was heading in that direction. You know, back to my argument, if you look at science, it explains 
it explains that. It absolutely you know, does. It's, you know, I mean, he, he created this, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, anyway. Yeah. What, what did you want to say about that? To respond as unpointed as I can to Bruce's question, uh, how does someone know the righteousness of God? I the divinity know. of God. The, the divinity of God. I don't know, but history has plainly showed us that human beings, regardless of if they're Romans or Eskimos or whoever, wherever, have a propensity, maybe a necessity, to connect with a supernatural world that interacts with their reality. We always have seen it. How that happens, where that comes from, I don't know if I was not born into a world of nothingness where I had to develop my own supernatural connection. Mm -hmm. uh, people do it, they always have done it. Mm -hmm. So there's something about us that connects to a supernatural, which if you think about it, is crazy, because why should that be? Well, could it, could it be because uh, We've never been able to create anything. We discover, which is our science, but we've never created something from nothing. So our deduction is, is that somebody did create that. We may put two chemicals together to come up with a, another substance, but we don't create the two chemicals. Plus, there's so much unknown in our lives that our fears motivate us to want to grab onto something. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's more to us. There has to be. Well, since our time is quickly coming to a close, what do we take away from our discussion this morning? Based on the beginning of this letter, he's setting up everything he's going to talk about in the book of Romans. And the one thing that we can apply and take away for ourselves is God has designed us to want to connect our reality to a greater, a greater being. And Paul is setting up his letter by, by a, he says he wants to preach to Gentiles, he wants to reap some harvest among them, and he's meeting them on that same level. He's finding a way to connect with them. We all have that, that, that want to reach out and connect us to a greater power. And he's saying, you have this explanation for this. Let me, let me show you another one. And then from there, in the rest of his letter, he's going to explain, he's going to give the gospel, he's going to preach the gospel to them. And so what do we take away from that? All of us have in, in, uh, built into us this want, this connection for, to a greater power. And we're always trying to seek and answer who that is. That's why we come to church, we come to worship God, we come to study more about him, to learn more about him. That way we can answer our own questions of who is this greater power and what am I going to do? How am I going to respond? How am I going to interact with him? At the very least, the one thing to take away, that is, that is a fundamental question we're all trying to answer, why we do what we do and while we're trying to study the Bible and understand God better. Thank you for all your comments and your questions this morning.